This is a Digital Music Trends 149 on the 11th of September 2013. This week on the show, Ministry of Sound takes on Spotify, iTunes Radio to launch on September the 18th, Songs as New Round, Ponos Bat on High Quality Audio, Xbox Music, and more. This week's show is sponsored by Media Law from Sheridans at sheridans.co.uk. Welcome to Digital Music Trends. I'm Andrea Leonelli, and this is the weekly show where we talk about and try to make sense of the week's news in the digital music industry. And DMT is available audio and video on a variety of channels including iTunes, most podcatchers, YouTube, SoundCloud, Mixcloud, Spreaker, Stitcher and TuneIn Radio. And to get in touch with the show, please tweet us on at Trends or email us on contact at digitalmusictrends.com. And this week on the show, three great guests, uh, all from the, here in the UK, which usually unfortunately means that Skype is going to crap out on us at some point. Uh, but first of all, we have uh, Lucy Blair, Digital Marketing Manager at Anjuna Beats. Uh, hi Lucy and great to have you on. How's it going? Hi, Andrew. Really good. Thank you. And thank you for having me. It's great to have you on. And uh, Lucy might jump in and out today uh, on the show just because she has a few meetings going on. But hopefully you'll be able to stick with us for, for the majority of the show. And then uh, uh, Eamon Ford for Music Ally, but also working for a variety of different publications. Uh, so hi, Eamon, and great to have you back. How's it going? Hello. I'm putting this up just in case my camera doesn't work. Uh, it's yeah. my slight tribute to <laughs> Bob Dylan. It's my Bob Dylan cue card moment. Hello. I'm nice. Fun. Awesome. And uh, uh, Jassy Scholar, director of Wicksteed Works. So, hi, Jassy, and uh, awesome to have you on. How's it going? It's good. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Great. So uh, let's start by, actually, I wanted to uh, uh, swap things around from what I usually do and just do a quick round of uh, uh, what you guys are up to first. So, uh, Lucy, anything on uh, the Anjuna Beat front that you want to plug or any interesting releases that you're working on at the moment? Uh, yes, definitely. Quite a few. Um, well, we're under doing a uh, taking acoustic show to Los Angeles at the Greek Theatre on the 12th and 13th of October. Awesome. Um, we're also working hard on Above Beyond Group Therapy 50, which is the 50th edition of the radio show, um, which is listened to by 30 million people worldwide. And um, the event's going to have uh, 10,000 fans there, and it's at Alexander Palace on 26th of October. So, um, yeah, working on that and can't wait. That's great. Awesome. Uh, Jassy, uh, what, what is Wixid Works and, and uh, what do you do there? What is Wixie Works? We're a, a director fan agency. We specialize in uh, helping artists, uh, labels, and brands with their director fan strategy. So that means building a mailing list, uh, managing the mailing list, um, and also we work on retail campaigns. So helping with uh, pre sales for albums, tours, that kind of thing. Um, that's what we do. Awesome. Great. Amon, any interesting piece or uh, uh, anything you're working on in particular that's, that's interesting to you? I'm kind of working on lots of things simultaneously, so I, I'm sure. as as I something I forget what I'm writing. I uh, what am I doing? Yes, I'm interviewing lots of people from stadiums around the world for a piece for Audience Magazine on music in stadiums. So I've just been oh, off great. the phone from someone in Denmark, and I've been speaking to people in goodness me, where have I been? United Arab Emirates, Australia. I've got somebody to speak to in New Zealand, Mexico, Argentina all over the world. So I'm learning lots of things about stadiums and music and awesome. how to put in uh, shows around football matches and things like that. So, oh, wow. And this week, uh, we're going to start by talking about the news that came out last Thursday. So just right after the, we recorded the, the show of last week. But it's actually a good thing, I think, because it uh, kind of gave us all a bit of a time to think about uh, sort of the issues and digest uh, the news. And uh, so what happened is the Ministry of Sound has decided to take Spotify to court and the action was taken uh, because of Ministry's compilations, uh, because Ministry of compilations were being replicated on Spotify by publicly available user-generated compilations uh, and playlists, I guess. And, and so Ministry requested for Spotify to take down these playlists and Spotify uh, chose to ignore the request or, or not to comply. And so that uh, spurred a lawsuit from Ministry uh, that claims, of course, that uh, the value of the curation of a playlist that they do is very high. And, uh, you know, the, the hope potentially going to try and leverage uh, the uh, database laws in the UK to protect uh, uh, what they perceive to be you know, a, a fairly clear-cut case for them, rooted in the company's success and popularity as a curator of playlists. Uh, so, so this could have, could have really repercussions far beyond uh, just uh, ministry. So uh, super interesting news. Uh, Eamon, you know, a few days of sitting on this news and reading a bunch of articles on this. Uh, you know, what's your take on the lawsuit and, and uh, how do you feel about it? 
It, I, I think it's a really, really interesting lawsuit because this is this is a kind of further extension of this whole Web 2.0 thing. So there's a, there's an element of user generated content, and it's infringing in copyright in a different way. Traditionally, it would be you take somebody's artwork or you take somebody's recording or composition, but this is about the running order. And so there's there's a whole issue of intellectual property within that, and there are precedents in the UK which uh, this, this has been dragged up and there's something to do with football fixture I don't know anything about football so I oh, can make no word but there's something about is it about the FA on the right to the football fixtures or something like that and there's also right. if we think about it things like the official charts company obviously yeah. own the rights to the charts and they license it to people like the BBC so they can they can run the charts on their uh, on their website and obviously ministry and Lucy can talk much more uh eloquently about this because uh, she used to work there, but yeah. uh, they don't license any music to Spotify, as I understand it, none of their own sound recordings. So, uh, and obviously compilations are a huge part of uh, the uh, the market, and they have been growing. There were, there were figures from the OCC at the start of the year where figure were sales like lots of ministry compilations, and now that's what I call music. And these things are doing really well, and they're doing yeah. well in downloads and the CD market still really important for them. So obviously this is this is a huge part of ministry's business is in curating these playlists or so coming up with the ideas so it could be electro 80s or whatever and then going through the very painful protracted process of licensing that yeah. content and then manufacturing the discs and so forth. So I, I can very much see what uh, Ministry of Science argument is for protecting this because this is a hugely important part of its business and it's not convinced about streaming and all of those uh, sorts of things. But I guess the, the problem is really for Spotify is this issue, I think it's really the use of the Ministry of Sound brand which is associated with it. Uh, mm -hmm. And this is something that their users, their 24 million users, are creating playlists all the time, and playlists was a huge driver for Spotify's uptake over the last few years. So I think that the, the real issue is how Spotify responds to takedown requests. So this goes back to issues of safe harbor laws in the U.S. covering things like um, YouTube, which seems to tend to comply to a degree with this, or yeah. other services like Groove Shark, who perhaps don't comply to this. So I think th there's definitely a, there's a, there's a kind of brand infringement if people are putting this up saying this is a Ministry of Sound compilation because it's not. It's not endorsed by Ministry of Sound. It's replicating a Ministry of Sound compilation of uh, of other recordings from other labels. So I think there's uh, I guess there's two issues there. It's the issue of intellectual pop copyright in a compilation, and then it's also the uh, the the infringement of the brand, the name brand yeah. tied in with the uh, Ministry of Sound as well. So I think it's obviously going to be incredibly important. Lots of people have kind of crowed about it. We know Ministry of Sound, they don't get digital. It's, it's, they're, they're just as bad as the majors were 12 years ago. But when you when you actually factor in how important this is to Ministry's business and how they migrate that online, I think yeah. this is... This will have huge repercussions for what we as users can do in terms of our compilations. Yeah. But on the flip side of that as well, if Ministry are successful and they own the IP in particular compilations that they've created, hypothetically, if six months down the line, Ministry do uh, Club Bangers of uh, 2013 compilation, which exactly, and um, by a uh, pure coincidence, uh, replicate something that some bloke in Darlington's made, could he then sue Ministry of Sound for stealing his intellectual pop yeah. uh, property rights in a compilation? I don't know, but that obviously he'd have to go to court and, yeah. and pay for that. <laughs> but it could it could set a really interesting precedent the other way. Yeah, yeah, and, and Lucy, Sorry, I uh, too much. I no, 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 it's it's great, it's great. And and Lucy, like I wanted to hear your your thoughts on, on this. So of course, uh, you know, the, the key point is that um, some of the compilation makers, like now, for example, are not so hung up on streaming just because they actually own the copyright, you know, it's a, a JV between, a joint venture between Universal and Sony, so they own the copyright on the song, so even if people stream them, they still well, get money from it. Uh, but, so, they, but they only, only own copyright on certain songs, because they've yeah, been licensed, yeah, 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 sure. licensed in from the indies as well. Of course, yeah, but I mean, like, uh, uh, as a whole, uh, like, a lot of the, you know, Maybe like you know, uh, more than half at least of the now songs are probably owned by by the companies that, that are putting them out. So they they are not as opposed to this as a Ministry, of course, because Ministry uh, the majority of the tracks that are on the Ministry compilations are licensed from other companies. So that means that 
if it is streamed uh, directly from you know uh, a different playlist, then they don't get any money off it, and so the, the value of that curation goes away. So, uh, you know, do you think that the, the questions here is more a question of branding and name and, and using the same name as a compilation, or actually the playlist itself and, and the list of songs and, and how they're curated? Um, that's a tough one. I mean, as you said, as Amos said, I mean, clearly there's a huge part of this case is has come about because. Um, it does pose such a danger to ministry's business model. Um, you know, the digital compilation side of the business is a huge part of their business. It drives a large part of their revenue. Um, uh, I think Lohan Presenter, who's the CEO, um, uh, made some comments to Digital Spy. I think that was online this morning, that piece, saying support for Spotify is dangerous. Uh, and the context that he was saying that in was... Um, that as a label, uh, for them, they feel it's dangerous to support Spotify as a business model because he doesn't feel it's sustainable. Um, yeah. He was saying, oh, their losses are growing. Uh, we don't think it's going to stack up for artists, the labels. Uh, we don't think it's a good thing for the industry. Um, but when I was reading that piece, I couldn't help being struck just by that um, that particular quote because obviously there's a, a kind of analogy here and that Spotify supports the Spotify for, um, as a consumer platform from consumers poses a huge danger to ministry's business model, as Amy was saying. Um, and Mark Mulligan uh, wrote a great piece uh, last week on his blog saying, you know, this is obviously all about the value of curation. Um, yeah. And I think, uh, obviously, in terms of the brand infringement, I think ministry have a very strong case. Um, obviously, in terms of the... Uh, the IP of the playlist, that's what we're really talking about, and whether or not they, they can win that. I don't think anybody can really say at this stage. Um, but of course, it's, it's hugely, the, the result's going to set a precedent for the entire industry, as you were pointing out earlier. Um, and Mark, Mark Mulligan was saying, you know, this comes down to essentially how essential, um, as a part of it, a core part of their product, is curation for the streaming services, because if it's really such a core factor, um, then, you know, they're clearly going to have to take action to, to that effect. But if yeah. it's not, then it's time for them to stop banging on about how important curation is. Um, so it's going to be really fascinating to see which way that this goes. Absolutely. And Jesse, like, um, we're seeing uh, all these services like uh, Songs Are, for example, uh, Daisy, the upcoming Daisy, uh, Deezer, you know, they're all investing a lot of money and human resources in creating curated playlists uh, and making sure that the users are happy with the experience that they get from the service. And so do you feel like this could also influence th that department in the sense that, of course, if, uh, you know, a third party service was to come and, uh, you know, siphon all the playlists that Daisy curates when it comes out and Put them up on, on their own service then i'm sure that a legal battle would come up then right yeah no it's, an, it's a really interesting point about this curation argument and I'm, i used to be a lawyer and I, I didn't practice copyright law but i did study it when i was at university right. so awesome. i had a little bit of background in this piece and i think that um you know it was, it was interesting to, to read the different articles that have come out this week that have discussed the various angles and i think that curation is undoubtedly of value it seems to be the, one of the main things you hear about besides revenue yeah. uh when it comes to streaming services lately um, I, I just want to say that I think that, um, I don't know, I think Ministry of Sound are in a tough position. There's certainly not the only business that's having a rough time with the changes in the music industry. I think that they, they seem to think they've come, up, come upon an argument that's possibly going to be of some use to them. But what I think they should really be focusing on is, is looking at these new platforms as an opportunity, which is what a lot of labels are doing, you know, and actually coming to the party and developing something special that actually will take some of that power back. And I think that Ministry of Sound are really miss missing a trick here. Yeah. yeah it's it's an interesting... Know, I, yeah, sure. Andre, I just want to say to, to that point, um, I course. can't obviously speak for Ministry because I don't work there anymore. Work there anymore. Yeah, of course. Because, because I'm new recently, I do know that they are actually working on um, a, a proposal and kind of project for other streaming services. Um, but Spotify in particular, obviously they run into this issue with because of their kind of the copyright and the brand infringement. Yeah, yeah, sure. Sure, but is there any reason why, sorry to jump on you, but is there any reason why Spotify's playlists are going to be any different from playlists set up on another platform? Why wouldn't they no, argue with them? No, not necessarily. Um, no, I totally see what you're saying. I think um, part of the problem is, is the refusal that, that Spotify have always presented to ministry to, to take down these playlists, and I think they haven't 
um, had that situation with other services, and that's that's why there seems to be such an issue with with Spotify in particular. Sure. I, I, I'm quite intrigued by the conspiracy theory that's been kicking around through this, which is, is this a play? And I should, I should stress for legal reasons that I'm merely repeating this conspiracy theory rather than endorsing it. <laughs> but uh, it's the idea that uh, ministry's taken this action to get equity stake in Spotify. All the majors do, and the independents kind of collectively do through Merlin. But I believe ministry had left AM, the Association of Independent Music, before that deal had happened, so effectively, so as far as I understand it, Ministry don't have an equity stake via the Merlin deal. Uh, but so this is this is one of the theories is that they're doing this to to give themselves an equity stake. So but I don't I don't know. It's it's it's, it's the JFK grassy knoll of digital. It's quite music. a messy way to go about it, isn't it? <laughs> well, I mean, it's not good for the well. wise. I think it's yeah, it's, it's the music industry. When has anything ever been done in a non messy way? <laughs> and, and let's not forget that this, this, this kind of lawsuit is an, is an enormous investment even for a company that is a large like ministry because it, mm -hmm. it can cost a lot, you know, it can cost upwards of a million, of a million pounds if it goes on for a while. So, well, uh, that's the yeah. thing, and with this lawsuit, it's Spotify that are going to be the defendants, but as, as some, some of these articles are pointing out, it's the users that are creating the playlists. So yeah. who are they after here, you know? Yeah, I guess they're after a takedown. Um, that's uh, that's what it's all uh, it's all about. And yeah, uh, there was a great dangerous. article actually about by Kieran Donoghue, uh, the founder of uh, Playlists on Net, which uh, some of you might remember as uh, a Share My Playlist. I've changed your name fairly recently. I, I was confused myself uh, a few weeks ago when I found out, uh, and I was trying to find Share My Playlist on Spotify, and it, and it had disappeared. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's Playlists on Net, and uh, he posted a great article on his blog. Actually, uh, I'll throw the links in the show notes about sort of his experience, of course, as a service that uh, is uh, wholly uh, devoted to uh, creating and, and allowing users to create and share playlists with one another and, and feature great playlists and stuff like that. Yeah, well, he, he, uh, he had mentioned kind of responding to various ministry takedown requests yeah. because obviously people are, people are doing that and um, playlists is one of the big places where he replicates it. And I think there was a degree of exasperation in his post where he said that he just didn't have the, 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 the small startup, he didn't have the finances to, to challenge this in court. Or to, to, so he basically just had to, to do the, the manual take down notes. So it would be interesting when Ministry, which is a significantly large independent record company with a huge, huge share of the compilation, when you see the end of year compilation sales, Ministry's kind of its now and then all of Ministry's compilations seem to take up the top five in any given year. They're, it's a huge, huge company, so they're going up against Spotify, so this will be a really interesting legal battle because you've yeah. got two quite powerful companies, one trying to build a business in one way and another trying to maintain a certain business. So it's, uh, I guess it's a, a snapshot for the, for the music industry in the 21st century. And uh, as always with these kind of lawsuits, it's always hard to... Uh, envision how an implementation is going to work because if for example uh, they get uh, of course uh, uh, some uh, you know you know the the, the court uh, decides that the the brand and trademark has been infringed because of the use of the name of the compilation and because this is a user generated uh, essentially uh, compilation that that is infringing and you know, users are driving the sharing of this compilation. What happens if all the users decide to uh, call all ministry releases from now forward? Uh, I don't know, door or armchair or you know any sort of <laughs> word, and then they you know they stop using the, the the name, but they keep using the same list, and and so there's yeah. there's lots of ways that that users can get around that. So it's going to be really interesting to monitor how the court wants to implement uh, this kind of uh, restriction, given that courts are usually very not not very well documented when it comes to implementing things on the technology front, as we've all seen when it comes to to piracy. So. It's, uh... I, th I, th I think Spotify policing the use of Ministry of Sound and Name is pretty straightforward. They could write something in the code that if somebody puts those three words in order in a playlist, they say, you can't do this, you have to yeah. change the name. But the whole issue of matching playlists and sequencing is going to be much harder. So possibly, as with YouTube, it may be the onus is on the copyright owner to police this and find this and then put through their takedown request yeah. and Spotify is given 24 hours or 48 hours to comply and that sort of thing yeah because yeah. i don't think i can't see ministry suing any of the users <laughs> no. <laughs> certainly not that would be because <laughs> otherwise otherwise we'd be back in 2001 again and nobody wants to go there <laughs> it'd be even worse it'd be like a, a lawsuit for an immaterial charge of metadata that's that's uh, yeah 
<laughs> it's not even an actual file exchange. It's it's amazing. Uh, but yeah, so that that's in, in, super interesting. I look forward to to hearing what's going to happen with that. And uh, and uh, yeah, thanks, uh, Lucy, for your insights as well. It's uh, super interesting to hear to hear uh, everybody's thoughts about this. Uh, and uh, uh, so the next news, uh, I guess we can address uh, last night's announcement by Apple. Uh, it is not much to say really. Apple announced two new phones: the iPhone 5s and the iPhone 5c. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, with iOS 7, which will launch on the 18th uh, of September, will also uh, you know I I iTunes Radio will also be launched uh, in the US. This uh, is something that has been you know talked about for months. Uh, we've talked about it on on digital music trends for months uh, as a rumor and then as a confirmed news. And uh, to be honest, there's not a great deal to say here uh, about it anymore uh, until it comes out. But I just wanted to hear your thoughts uh, on whether you think Apple can deliver in providing a service that A, works well on its own as a standalone service and B, can boost download sales uh, as well. Uh, Jesse, what are your thoughts on this? I, I'm pretty skeptical, to be honest. Um, I'm interested to see what it's like, but I, I mean, it's such a crowded marketplace right now. I feel like there's so many options. I don't have much need for more than a couple of options. That's a very skeptical outlook. I'll give it a try, possibly. But this thing about this revolutionary inclusion of buy buttons alongside tracks being a driver of sales, I mean, I'd also be very skeptical about that. Yeah. Sp Spotify used to have buy options, didn't it, for like seven digital, I think, and, and maybe yeah. Amazon. And they took, they took them down because probably, I assume, they were collecting cobwebs, you know. Yeah. Yeah. What What did they do? Well, they had a deal with Seven Digital, and then they ended the deal with Seven Digital, and then started doing the fulfillment themselves, yeah. and then very quietly kind of mothballed it. Yeah, uh, Lucy. Well, you know, do you feel like there is a chance for Apple to deliver uh, a service that really changes the game? I mean, uh, these services are always driven by demand. Like we've seen, Shazam is doing so well. Why? Because mm -hmm. people want to find out. You know the music that, that you know a great track that they just heard, heard and they want to find out what it is and then they buy it. But you know, is the same applicable to internet radio? Do you think? Um, it's a tough one. I think, like Jesse, I'm I'm quite skeptical. Obviously, they have a lot of competition in this area. Um, it's going to be a big test for iAds as well, which yeah. to date um, haven't exactly uh, <laughs> put in a stellar performance. <laughs> um, so that'll that'll be interesting. But you know, obviously, they're competing in terms of advertising for sort of mobile and radio advertising dollars, again, with, you know, a lot of other services. Um, and like Jesse, I'm not too convinced about how, how well it's going to perform in terms of driving, driving download sales just from, from the internet radio wider. Um, and, you know, I don't think they've really announced anything that makes me think, yeah, this is going to be a game changer right now. Yeah. It's just another service that's going to compete with loads of others. Um, I can't think of one thing that they've announced about so far that really kind of grabs my attention and goes, yes, this is going to be the standout service to watch. Yeah. I mean, at least it's it's free, so in a sense, it's much more accessible than Google's, uh, you know, play, play or, or music uh, all access. Uh, uh, I never get that right. <laughs> I always confuse the word. It's, it's got the longest name in the world. It's the longest name in the world. It's like a place uh, in Wales with the unpronounceable name. Yeah. <laughs> and so, in a, in a sense, like at least you get it for free. So, if you anybody that buys an iPhone can turn it on and. Potentially, I don't know how it's going to be presented, but maybe like in the welcome bit, you're going to be like, oh, you can access this for free. And so that could be a big driver, I guess, for more so than, than Google's paid for service. I think, well, I'm, I'm going to be slightly more positive in my take of it because I think this is, yeah. this is a, a kind of uh, a stepping stone for Apple, I think. I don't think this is going to be a final solution. Obviously, downloads are still a really, really big part. They're still growing. Uh, but they will hit a ceiling quite soon because there is that move from ownership to access. And iTunes was an important point in moving the, the thing from CD to a la carte purchase. And I think the the Apple environment, the contact stuff, I think, has to be uh, taken into account here. Because we had mentioned Spotify, but Spotify was ostensibly a free service to consumers so throwing in downloads wasn't that was just like a side bit of their business and it wasn't the the ideology let's say that consumers approached the service with but with itunes itunes is very clearly a purchase business and people know that you buy music through itunes so i think yeah. just the psychology of people using a service like itunes radio and knowing and if you think how easy it is through uh 
iOS to buy stuff because it's linked to your accounts and now they've got this fingerprint and yeah. technology on the, on the new devices. The whole thing's incredibly seamless and that's the great thing uh, that Apple does uh, better than anybody else. The whole thing's completely seamless. So I think they, the technology and just the way that people have understood how you get content from iTunes because people have kind of criticized Apple for the fact that it's unbundle the album that kind of thing but also if you think of iTunes come along in 2003 in the States 2004 here it actually taught people to pay for downloads at a time when none of the service if you remember uh, press play and music net and those awful awful services that they the labels were trying to get off the ground nobody was interested and Apple came along and and against all the odds create a business model where people would pay for stuff. So I, th yeah. I think with that pedigree, I think it would be dangerous to discount them completely. But I think that ultimately they're going to have to fold iTunes as a store because people are going to stop consuming that way. I think this is this is like a trainer brand digital service for them rather than uh, the final thing. Yeah. So I think it's, yeah. it's them testing and, and managing that, mi that migration because – in, in that migration that the labels had to handle from high volume uh, CDs down to downloads, they had to adjust that. Apple's got its kind of head around a per track model. So if it's going to go down to a per stream rate or something like that, it has to handle that transition in the same way that labels had it forced on them, really, that transition from CD to download. So yeah. I, I agree. Apple's, Apple's doing that because it, it, can, it can kill off the iTunes business overnight. That would yeah. be insane because. It's what is it, over a million tracks a week? No, two million tracks a week or something in the UK are being sold yeah. alone. It's a huge, huge business. Yeah, mm. I totally agree. I mean, I, I, I guess the, the one thing that we probably need to take into consideration as well is the fact that we always look at the UK and US markets where downloads has probably peaked already and are starting to, you know, you know they are still selling huge amounts, but, you know, I can't imagine we're going to see a huge amount of growth in the next few years uh, on the download front. Uh, but there are emerging markets where, downloads still are sort of the, the new thing or are still sort of gaining ground so it's going to be interesting if itunes radio launches in a bunch of new markets where itunes itself has only actually just launched in the past like two or three years whether we're going to see a massive growth in download sales for those particular markets and, and that might be an interesting result of the whole thing and also, uh, you've got to factor in how much money Apple have in the bank. They've just got billions <laughs> of dollars in the bank and Spotify losing money. Uh, Last FM losing money. Pandora been going for years, still yeah. losing money. None of these services. So Apple can. Apple's got the deepest pockets of all. So it can just. It can run this as a loss leader for once and just slowly pick off the competition. And it it makes a load of money. And now, obviously, with the new low cost handset, that's its kind of iPod Mini moment. This is where its devices, where its phones go properly mainstream. When when the iPod came along, it was a very expensive device. And then the iPod Mini became the biggest selling device in the range because of the price. So factor that in as well. How many more millions of people are going to buy an Apple phone and, and buy yeah. into the iTunes ecosystem as well. So there's there's a lot of a lot of factors kind of that coming into it. Here. And they can they can very happily run for years and lose money and <laughs> while everybody else is crying. <laughs> yeah, sure. And uh, uh, of course, you know, we always have to take into context the fact that I, I think Apple's cash reserves are like now upwards of 120 billion. Uh, and uh, I think the offer from uh, uh, that uh, uh, Japanese carrier uh, towards Universal Music, which was actually much higher than the actual valuation of Universal Music, was about seven billion. So if you take that into account, uh, <laughs> you see there's uh, there's oh, a bit of a discrepancy it's there. It's insane. Yeah. It, it's it's crazy. And in the second half of the show, we're going to talk about Songza, Pono and Xbox Music, amongst other things. But first, an information piece from this week's sponsor of Digital Music Trends, media law firm Sheridan's. And I'm here with uh, Tahir Bashir from uh, Sheridan's. Uh, great to have you on. And uh, let's talk about uh, collection societies this week. So uh, what is the role of collection societies, societies in an artist's career? Right. Uh, first of all, I think it's important to explain what a collection society is. Um, so in this country, you're talking about on the recorded side, there's PPL. Uh, on the video side, there's VPL. And on the publishing side, the songwriting side, there's PRS for music. Uh, typically for an artist, it's really, uh, in the earlier days of their careers, it's mainly PRS with a bit of PPL. Um, 
Uh, why are they important? Well, uh, in many cases, it's the first income that artists receive. So it's really important that when artists write songs, uh, record songs, and they're out there, that they're registered to a collection society. Otherwise, that income will just sit there. Um, if they're registered, then they'll get um, uh, royalty checks coming through from PRS and, and, and PPL. Yeah, sure. And uh, uh, other potential downsides to being registered to a society at all? It's interesting because, uh, you know, when you register, say, for example, to the PRS, you actually, as a songwriter, you assign certain rights to the PRS. So that uh, means that the PRS have the ability to offer blanket licenses, for example, when your music's used on TV, um, which means that you lose a bit of control around that. So uh, the downsides are primarily uh, deals which can get done without your control. Um, some uh, some uh, entities are looking for artists that aren't registered to collection societies to get around that whole issue. Uh, if artists enter into those types of deals, they've got to be sure that they're going to get paid the type of income that they'd expect. Generally, it's a good thing to register with collection societies. Absolutely. How important is data? I know that uh, the PRS, for example, encourages artists to register their songs as soon as possible, but do artists do that? Uh, a lot of artists don't. Uh, obviously, when a manager comes on board, that's one of the first things that they should be doing. Um, and you know, in terms of data, you know, d data in this day and age is what people get paid for. So, if your song is registered with the collection society, the collection society can track its use, can get it monetized, and then pay out for 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 the artist. That's great. Thank you. Until next week. Uh, and uh, I wanted to talk about Songza for a second. I, I mentioned uh, mentioned the company earlier. Uh, there was uh, the news uh, reported by TechCrunch uh, by Eliza Brook that uh, the company has just raised a new round of funding uh, for 4.7 million dollars. This is in addition to the 2 million that they raised in 2011. Uh, although you know, 2 million for two years is actually a pretty good going, really, for for a startup of their size. Uh, you know, the the last numbers were 6 million installs uh, in May and 4.7 million listeners uh, in March, which is uh, pretty good. And I'm sure they've grown since. Then. Uh, the company wants to focus on monetization and advertising and develop to better ways to engage consumers in the uh, advertising experience. So they have advertising sponsored playlists uh, that are apparently uh, creating really good engagement within the platform. So, uh, you know, uh, the, the company is growing. It, uh, it seems to be doing well. Uh, of course, we're not really privy to whether they're losing money and, and how much that is. Uh, but uh, uh, and, and also one other thing is that they might be integrating talk with the music. So that's another really cool, interesting thing that I think would be great. Uh, we've seen this Spreaker uh, partnership with iHeartRadio recently, which uh, also uh, sort of looks at integrating music with uh, speech and, and spoken word content. So uh, I don't know. Uh, what's your take on Songza, uh, uh, Lucy? Do, do you feel like... Uh, we need something like this in the UK to come in and uh, create this whole market that doesn't really exist yet here? Um, but I think it has a lot of interesting uh, kind of USPs to it that you know, other services don't have. Um, everything you, you read about it, all the PR and stuff seems to be incredibly positive. Yeah. Um, it's interesting to note that people like Troy Carter and Peter Vaughan, you know, are among the investors because obviously they don't mess around. They're only going to put their money into into companies that they really think are worth it. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's got huge kind of power behind it. Um, I guess with those two in particular, not just in terms of money, but in terms of obviously their music marketing expertise. Jesse, uh, for, for on, on your end, uh, do you, you know, of course you deal a lot with artists uh, directly as well. Do you feel like they could benefit from the growth of, a, of an internet radio ecosystem that in the UK, uh, due to rates, uh, from what I understand, doesn't quite exist yet? Yeah, I mean, well, I guess I, I'd need to know. I, I'm actually not that familiar with songs or I've heard about it a lot. But I've not really figured out how it works or what the point of difference is. It, it has playlists that are based on mood, is that right? That's right, yeah. I mean, it's a very easy sort of... Uh use case you know you, you just turn on the app you say you, you can sort of tell you can guess what you're doing based on time of the day so it gives you ba a bunch of options at the beginning or you can search for other things that you, you might be doing at the time and then it presents you with another list of options which are uh, centered around uh, genres so if you say i want like going to sleep music and then it'll ask you yeah. like what genre okay, you want so to do I, i'm familiar with bloom you know bloom Right. Dot, dot FM. Yeah. It sounds like a similar sort of a proposition. I mean, I, I think that going back to the curation stuff that we were talking about earlier, um, as this celestial jukebox, as we used to call it in the old days, as this is now a reality, more or less, um, you know, we have choice paralysis. So 
I think curation is amazing. I don't know. Yeah. I'm, hopefully, I'm being consistent with what I said earlier. Yeah. Um, but no, curation is good, and I think that if you base it on a mood, that's great. I did. I quite liked what um, was said in the in the TechCrunch story, uh, where they compared. Uh, this advertising model to having a conversation before you ask for the phone number, right? I think that's really important. Um, and it's sort of a, a premise that we, we look to in direct-to-fan strategy as well. Yeah, exactly. Um, I'm not really sure whether sponsored playlists with, with these ads combined are going to be the way to do that. But if no one's done that yet, then hey, let's give it a try. Exactly. And I was talking, I had a feature actually on a company, F Sharp, last week. They do a lot of work with uh, um, uh, Spotify uh, and uh, they've created a lot of uh, branded experiences around the uh, user uh, personal, like personalized uh, playlists for users that uh, the brands uh, are generating through these uh, various applications. So it sounded like they had a lot of success through okay. by doing this with brands. So uh, I can see, I can't see why songs that wouldn't have a similar type of success with uh, with this approach. Uh, so it means, I mean, who's going to be paid that money from these advertisers? Is it going to be uh, songs or is it going to be the artists that see this money? Did I miss that point? Well, I guess uh, songs operates on a, on a uh, internet radio license like Pandora. So the, they pay uh, Sound Exchange and uh, the the various other collection societies, and then uh, that money gets split mm. by the society. I don't think they they yeah, pay no, any I, artists. I used are... to do a little bit of work. Well, I used to work for PRS, so I know a little yeah. about these licenses. But I think that when you've got a, I think it comes down to per user and per turnover, doesn't it? So I guess that would affect the the size of the license fee. Yeah. So I'll answer my own so. question. I would imagine so. Yeah, yeah definitely. Uh, uh, Amon Songza, would you like to say here? Uh, well, I'm, I'm just I'm interested that people are still invested in services, so that's got to be a good thing that VCs yeah. still think that these types of services are worth investing in. But I guess my ultimate concern, which goes back to what the point I was talking about when we were talking about uh, Spotify and Last FM and Pandora, no, these services have, have kind of long pedigrees and they can't seem to make the numbers add up. They're certainly yeah. not yet. So. Uh, it's just a, there's, it's another service, and I think a, a lot of these services are, are quite nice. People talk about Spotify. People get really excited about Spotify, but it's, when you put it in context, there's only 24 million people across something like 30 markets. <laughs> it's it's minuscule, but it's got something like one. If you look at the population of those countries, it's got like something ridiculous, like one percent penetration. These are really really small operations, so it's it's not until they hit proper scale. So. Ultimately, I'm happy the VCs still haven't been completely burned by the music business and prepared to invest in it. But uh, the kind of the realist in me suggests that only a few of these are ever going to make it make it through. I think most of them are going to crash and burn, and yeah, exactly. it's kind of sad to see. And I think that that when there when there are lots of uh, kind of roadkill uh, kind of mounting up on the side of the road, I think that may spooked the VCs again when they were yeah. they were spooked a few years ago and kind of tentatively came back. So I think it's kind of, uh, it could be interesting uh, in terms of precedent. But I do hope that some of these services actually make it because I think just having one service dominate and all is just really bad for the industry. It's yeah. really bad for the consumer. So I think there, there needs to be, there need to be diverse services, but Absolutely. profitability and viability is still really well. difficult for them. <laughs> yeah. And uh, let's talk for, let's go from one. Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Sorry, just thinking, uh, sure. it'll be interesting to see what happens when beat music launches as well um, and how similar that is to songs are and whether that's going to be a threat to songs because obviously they've made a huge deal about how a curated playlist is going to be such a big thing to them. So that's going to be interesting to see. Yeah. Uh, I think also be beta are going into, and they're going back to this Apple point again about not just making money through uh, streaming music. If Beats, obviously, they've got Ian Rogers from Top Spin involved, and they are going to have some form of Top Spin integration. So it'll be selling merchandise, tickets through the player, that kind of thing. That possibly could work because obviously uh, Top Spin's got a good pedigree, and somebody like Ian Rogers has got an enormous amount of respect in the music industry. So I think it's a really clever appointment. Uh, so maybe they that that model of of kind of making making your margins elsewhere outside yeah. of uh, streaming music could work. So maybe that's what these services need to look at. Is obviously Apple can offset all its losses through its uh, enormously profitable hardware sales, but everybody else is kind of standing in the middle of the floor naked. So. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, what I'm wondering, actually, is it's interesting because I was talking about, to Vivo uh, uh, last week uh, about 
uh, you know, the way they integrated some of the uh, band page information within within the viewer platform to make sure it stays up to date with biographies and stuff like that. And uh, I was thinking in just now, uh, may uh, uh, whether the integration between Topspin and and Daisy, if that actually happens, whether that might actually hinder Topspin in the way that it can branch out to other streaming services and integrate with a, a variety of different platforms if the other streaming services per- perceive Topspin as being uh, too closely associated with Daisy and, and therefore don't want to integrate that particular service w- within their own. Uh, because uh, you know, I think that there's a need for a marketplace that spans across several different services to make it really uh, you know, driving change and, and really creating uh, something interesting within the industry. I'm not sure if that's, uh, that's wrong, but uh, it, I just had that thought. No, that's, yeah. can I just, can I, can I step in here? Sure. Uh, well, I think Topspin's working on its artist link branch yeah. of its services, which will be what integrates with Daisy. Yeah. Um, so artist link is already pushing content through to YouTube, in, MTV, yeah. and you can also um, power your, your YouTube merch annotation sales via that service. So it's interesting that you say when, when we think of it as possibly being made available as a module which can plug into other streaming services. To me, that sounds really smart. Yeah. But as you've pointed out, like, it, it, might, it might not be something... I'm not sure whether that's in the roadmap, actually. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, let's go from one really niche thing to uh, which, uh, as you pointed out, Amon in Spotify, in terms of audience, to an uh, even smaller uh, uh, idea in terms of a potential audience, which is uh, uh, Neil Young's Pono. So uh, I wanted to talk about this just because we keep hearing about it and, uh, you know, it's going to happen, apparently, now. So uh, if you haven't heard of what, what this is, it's uh, Neil Young's uh, uh, high-quality audio service. You know, he's really pushing it very hard uh, for a few months now. Uh, so he wants to bring uh, high-quality audio back to the consumer and uh, has created a device and a service that go, uh, um, uh, you know, that, that go together to provide this high-end uh, audio experience to the consumer. So uh, he announced on Facebook that this is going to launch early next year. Uh, this, he said, uh, the simplest way to describe what we've accomplished is that we've liberated the music of the artist from the digital file and restored it to its uh, original artistic quality as it was in the studio so it has primal power hearing Pono for the first time is like the first blast of daylight when you leave a movie theater on a sun-filled day it takes a second to adjust then you enter a bright reality a wonderfully re- re- of wonderfully rendered detail so he goes on to say that it's going to be a hardware and software play that uh, they really want to access original masters to uh, you know, go back to the source and get the best quality possible uh, for the audio, and uh, you know all sorts of things that sound completely, you know, very complicated to implement. So uh, let's 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 go over the three aspects that I think are, are making this a super high risk venture. First of all, are users ever going to be sold again on the idea of having a separate hardware device that they have to carry around to listen to music? After you know, we've all gotten used to listening to music on our phones. Uh, uh, Jesse, do you have any? You know, would would you buy a Pono, or do you think anybody would? I don't think I would, unfortunately. Yeah. I mean, not as a standalone portable player. I think that I, I'm not sure whether this has been talked about in the press releases. I haven't seen it, but I think that the area that they could look in is the home system, where you've got systems like Sonos, yeah. um, which you know, good sound and they and they're connected and everything. Obviously, that's not quite going to fit in with the business model theoretically. If these are all like kind of special files that come from the Pono store. So I think that a separate player is going to be a hard sell, but as you introduce this, it's, it is always going to be a, a niche for this product. Yeah, and and Amon, uh, looking at the second aspect, which is uh, that of going back to the masters uh, to get all this content, like that's going to be a incredibly expensive, and B is going to generate a very small catalog. I mean, I can't imagine. I used to work in a in that space of you know finding masters and remastering tapes and all that kind of thing, and it's expensive. It's you know they're hard to find. It's hard to get consent. Uh, I just can't imagine they could build a particular large catalogue catalog with that. Yeah, well, it's, it's going to be really expensive for uh, record labels because all of the different services want their files delivered in a different way, and it's it's really expensive and it's really time consuming for them. And I know, having spoken to people uh, in the catalogue divisions and labels, they're, they're just going. There's stuff that we're, we're just never ever going to digitise because there isn't the market for it. Yeah. It might maybe sell a hundred copies or something, but the time and the investment they don't care. So that this is Pono is just another format that uh, the the record companies are going to have to deliver into and I think that it's it's really for audio files or audio bores if you want that, that can really tell the difference and I think most people really don't care they really really 
are not interested in that sort of thing. Maybe Neil Young's fans are, and maybe that's about it. But all of these people, anyway, if they're such audiophiles, will be buying on vinyl, and they will, they'll want kind of heavy-duty vinyl anyway. So they will see digital as the kind of... Uh, a, a uh, Satan's miasma is what they'll see it as. They just they won't they they will just see it as terrible, and they go, "Oh, you can't hear the bottom end," and all of these yeah. things that only studio engineers and producers understand. And people talk about this way. It's one of those things that you never really challenge people who talk about these things because nobody really knows. It's just it, it's just this esoteric language that people talk about, and I don't think most of the people who talk about it really understand it. I think you have to be a proper musician, musicologist, engineer, top of your game to really understand this stuff. Most of us, are, we're just kind of bluffing around, kind of going, yeah, it just sounds a bit toppy. Or we, and we don't know what it means. So, But I, I just think this target market, Neil Young's target market, is or men of a certain age who read Uncut magazine and who want to read lots and lots of stories of bands taking lots of cocaine in the 70s and listening to stuff on vinyl. Um, for them, music stopped 35 years ago, unless yeah. it's something like Fleet Foxes that sounds really like something from 1972. So you're already <laughs> excluding the, the audience. It's, it, it's, it's kind of, it's inviting people into a lovely home and then saying, oh, there's no floor there because they, yeah. they don't want to stay there because they don't care about digital. I don't think it's going to take something really big to convince. Maybe people, super Neil Young fans, will get it because they kind of believe in Neil's spirit and all of that sort of thing. But I just think most people will just shrug and not care and yeah. stream Harvest and After the Gold Rush on Deezer or Spotify or Audio, which yeah. I can highly recommend. They're great, great albums. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and, and Lucy, from a, from a label perspective, uh, of course, you know, you have to, you know, you have artists that are producing really high quality digital releases these days, especially on the electronic front, uh, you know, that could be released as 96, uh, uh, you know, uh, K or whatever, and, and, you know, really high bit rates, uh, and, and you probably lose something by compressing them quite, quite as much as they have to be compressed. Uh, would you, do you think there is, there is an interest from labels that are producing new, you know, electronic music or, you know, on, on the indie front to release any higher quality material as well? Again, I I have to agree with what the others said and probably say no. I mean, you know, David pointed out it's going to be very expensive and essentially you'd be doing it for such a niche market that I think most labels will just go, what is the point? Um, You know, especially for, you know, small label like like us. I mean, you know, yes, you undoubtedly lose sound quality by compressing it, but um, at the end of the day, does does the consumer care? No, of course not. I mean, let's face it. Most mainstream music consumers don't have a clue about sound quality, as Aim has already said. They don't know the difference between, you know, what it is. Um, they don't care. You know, Neil, Neil Young's criticised the sound quality that you get when you purchase something or buy iTunes, but let's think about how successful iTunes have been. You know, does the mainstream music consumer care? No. Are they ever going to? Honestly, I don't think so. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, you'd be reaching a really small niche audience and, I kind of like what they're they're trying to do in terms of oh we could get access to exclusive masters and things. Yeah, that sounds great in theory. Um, of course, again, as I said, it's going to be very expensive and difficult to do. And if they could build that side up a bit enough so that they could really deliver really exclusive access, you know, again, maybe they might you know interest a few more people i was just going to say that what you were saying just now lucy reminded me of a story i read recently about digital photographs and it was talking about kodak and polaroid and how kodak got really caught up with creating the most amazing photo quality and the best paper and it was expensive but it gave you the most amazing photographs and what we all learned from that you know 10 years later or 20 years later was that people don't want the best photograph paper they don't really care they just want to take heaps and heaps of little photos on a crappy little phone and be able to show them to people quickly and then throw them away. So I think there's a really similar argument here. It was the same sort of thing. Yeah. And Lucy, I, I don't know much about electronic music stores, but like, do they sell higher quality bit rate music for DJs, for example? How does that work? Um, I think, I mean, if you were talking about something like Beatport, for example, uh, I mean, it's, it's not that much different. They still have to sell like quality files. Yeah. Um, there are newer services like Pulse Locker and, and yeah. they've been talking about, um, you know, making uh, higher quality audio available. Um, so, you know, it'll be interesting to see how, how they perform and, and what kind of traction they get in the market. 
um, beyond, you know, DJs and artists. Um, but no, I mean, uh, I mean, it's all like before we, you know, you're looking at sort of press quality again, really. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Do you know what's quite interesting about these these high quality files, though, is that what you find is that the bandwidth they take up is so much more. So, I mean, a recent campaign that we, we did here at Wixted was with a Paul McCartney release for Wings Over America. So he reissued this three CD live recording of Wings Over America, and you could buy it in an amazing box from Amazon. Um, and when you bought this amazing box from Amazon, you got a download code to these high-res 24-bit, 96 kilohertz files. Now, those files from three CDs, that was five gig of download. It's not, you know, your average browser can't possibly download a five gig file. So, you know, we worked with them to cut this five gig into smaller chunks and create a, a custom page where people could download uh, using a code system. So, I mean, that also poses an issue, this, the file sizes. If there's full albums, these are big files, it's expensive to download, and it's problematic. Yeah. I love this quote uh, where Neil Young said, we're, we're liberating the music of the artist from the di digital file. But if the file is like five gigabytes, <laughs> you haven't yeah. really, really liberated anybody from the file. It's more no, like... <laughs> you're weighing down <laughs> You're chaining them into the file. <laughs> I once, I once saw Neil Young live at Hammersmith uh, Apollo, and while he played, uh, you weren't allowed to come in out of the venue in between songs to uh, have a drink or go to the toilet or anything like that. And as he played, he had a man behind him with a big easel, uh, pinned in, uh, doing pins inspired by Neil's music. So I think, with the greatest respect to Neil Young, he needs to get a grip. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, you know, I, all hats off to him. I, I'm really interested in seeing whether this will sell anything at all. I mean, it'd be interesting to see whether it does, but, uh, you know. Uh, maybe, maybe Neil Young can put out his new album exclusively on that. That would really <laughs> drive people in. I love to see crazy ideas and see if they work. I mean, as long as it's not my money. I'm just wondering if you if you set a old set funnel up, then you'll just get ear splitting feedback as well when when you've got on anything by Crazy Horse. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Maybe if Neil Young releases his new album exclusively, then Pono will liberate us from Neil Young. <laughs> <laughs> <That'd be Ooh>. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, we're going to move on and talk about uh, consoles and TVs and uh, music and stuff. Uh, so uh, there's a couple of stories. Uh, first, first of all, uh, from Microsoft, that's the biggest one uh, of the week. Microsoft yesterday launched uh, finally its Xbox music service on iOS and Android as native apps. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, a few months ago, it made available the service on uh, actually a few weeks ago uh, as as a browser, a web browser based experience. And now uh, on the web browser, you can actually get a six month trial period on Microsoft uh, Xbox Music, uh, although it's uh, capped at ten hours uh, per month and only for six months. And so this is interesting because it puts Xbox Music finally on par with uh, uh, the likes of Spotify, Deezer, and, and all the all the other streaming services. Uh, it's also interesting because uh, we are sort of on the on the eve. Uh, you know, in a few weeks, there's going to be the Xbox One. There's going to be a Announced, and that's going to put a lot of focus back on the ancillary products that are surrounding the Xbox ecosystem. So uh, it's it's an interesting time for them to do this, and uh, it could help uh, expand the Xbox Music Service uh, audience. Uh, you know, uh, well, what do you feel about this? And, and do, do you think that this particular move uh, is made to leverage the publicity that they're going to get from the Xbox One launch and and try and get some more subscribers that way? Uh, anybody want to take that one? <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I, re I really don't know much about gaming. I don't have uh, the last gaming console I had was a Sega Mega Drive, and that was my sister's. I play Sonic the Hedgehog, so uh, I don't know whether it's Microsoft. Microsoft's a big brand, but I think it's with Zoom and stuff like that. It's kind of it's trying it's come in, and it's it's not really done anything. And I think it's kind of been left behind a little bit. If you yeah. think about the the three kind of. Um, Californian heavyweights coming in here, or, or American heavyweights. If you've got Amazon, if you've got Google, and you've got Apple, that's they. The Microsoft were a huge, huge brand, but I just don't think they can close that that gap. And they, the, I guess the parallels or something in the hardware sector with Nokia as well. With uh, with that, it, it's just kind of other companies have kind of come in, still under thunder. It's it's, it's going to be a really, really hard gap to close. And obviously, within the the gaming community, Xbox is a really big brand, but I think. Music for them is its background. It's not something that they kind of sit for. They they want to play whatever latest game that they they play. And 
and play online against their mates and kind of strangers at, um, and that kind of thing. So I, I think music's there and it's important to them, but I think it's, it's a gaming platform, so it's about gaming first and foremost. Yeah, you gotta wonder whether it's uh, in any way central to Microsoft's strategy, or whether they're just keeping it alive because it doesn't cost them very much money, and no, it I makes sense right. for them to have it. I don't think it's central to their strategy at all. I can go one better than Eamon and say that the only gaming platform I've ever had was an Atari in the early eighties. <laughs> wow! Yeah, I think I feel like I'm flying around in a like It was pretty antique. It was like wood panel finish. It was oh, yeah. I miss it, you know, we've been discussing it a lot lately, it's funny. But yeah, like you say, I think that, I mean, Xbox is a gaming platform, I know nothing about gaming, I think I've demonstrated, but um, it's known, they're known for gaming, I think that they're just adding a streaming service in because they figure that Xbox users want to play some music, we may as well keep them in the Xbox um, ecosystem, right? So yeah. in, that, in that sense, I think that it's just a big company that can afford to somehow get the licenses they need, um, which is kind of interesting, I think, in itself. Um, but it's, I, I guess it's almost like a sort of a lost leader, possibly, if yeah. it can even be called that. I thought that it was interesting they were you know, considering um, this kind of a splinter product, which would be the app, which is going to be divorced from the gaming, as far as I can see. They're going to have an Android and iOS app for music. Um, and the fact that it's going to function on competitors' handsets is, is interesting, I guess, yeah. in itself, because that does sort of suggest that they are actually giving it some, some weight. Um, so yeah. Yeah, but yeah. Lucy, I guess like if they had any users to begin with uh, with the streaming service, surely they would have lost them over the last sort of two years, whilst they didn't update their system to allow for third-party access uh, to the service, right? I yeah. mean, if you if you have been subscribing to Xbox <laughs> Music. Yeah, I mean, obviously in the meantime, you know, all the services like Spotify, Audio, Deezer, and stuff have gained huge traction. Um, even if, as Amy points out, overall, you know, in terms of the world population, they're still minuscule. But anyway, um, yeah, I mean, Xbox have been talking about, uh, you know, bringing more people in and how opening up to the public and, you know, having it online, having their apps and stuff is going to open it up to a wider audience. But, um, you know, they've been talking about things like all oh, the benefits of having multiple devices linked to Microsoft's platform. Um, they said, you know, for example, that you'll be able to save favorites and playlists. Um, across PCs, Windows phones, Xbox games, consoles, but you know, yeah, I don't use a Windows phone. <laughs> I don't use an Xbox game console. You know, I have like I have an iPhone. Sure, I could use their app and whatever, but you know that that kind of functionality, I think, unless you're a hardcore Microsoft user, is not really going to be that that useful uh, to yeah. the general music listening public. Um, and yeah, they're they're kind of banking on I think the fact that opening it up is going to you know help bring people into that ecosystem but you know unless you're a gaming fan I, I, I struggle to see that really happening I struggle to see them really gaining that much traction uh, like the others have said you know, music was to me but afterthought for them yeah um, more than anything more than so, anything uh, a nice optional extra perhaps if you were already gaming yeah and, and you see sometimes uh companies really struggle with keeping up with what's going on. Like Rhapsody, I think, only introduced offline uh, caching uh, on their apps, like literally a few months ago, which seems like a crazy move, considering that uh, they've been around for so long and they would have had the chance to do that ages ago. So uh, I don't know, sometimes uh, things just get lost in, uh, in the day-to-day -day of like running a company or a service like that, and, and they just don't uh, add normal stuff like an iOS app which uh, you know every other startup with like five developers can put out and I'm sure Microsoft could have introduced a year ago. <laughs> yeah I mean they're talking about you know thinking across different ex Microsoft devices and things they think well you know it could just use something like Tomahawk where you know I can save music and, and play across multiple platforms and services and things and you know a service like that in my opinion is way ahead of just a kind of a bit of a walled garden of oh I can think everything across Microsoft devices. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And uh, finally, uh, finally for today, uh, the uh, another gaming story, but just uh, really quickly because it's it's not that interesting for music. But just uh, uh, you know, Sony has launched uh, decided to enter the living room market as well with a PS Vita TV. So that's a bit like an Apple TV or a Chromecast or any of these cons uh, you know devices that we've talked about over the last uh, few months. Uh, uh, you know, there's no specific date uh, for launching in anywhere but Japan, uh, where it will cost about a hundred bucks. Uh, uh, again, pricing in line with all the other consoles uh, on on the high end, like uh, the Apple TV, for example. Uh, it will allow streaming of music, movies, and all sorts of stuff uh, uh, in the living room through the TV. 
I would imagine the service that's going to be hooked up to this is going to be Sony Music Unlimited, at least for the beginning, for launch, because uh, there aren't actually that many streaming services that have launched in Japan yet. Uh, so I would imagine that would be probably the front runner. Uh, and, you know, Sony is just playing catch up. Uh, exactly. I mean, I don't think that we can make any more comments uh, than what we made uh, about Microsoft, because they're also playing catch up in this space and they haven't really innovated a great amount. I don't know if anybody has anything else to add on, on Sony uh, at this point or... No, yeah. I think they're just, they're just pulling Microsoft, aren't they, and kind of going, oh, this is, you know, an affordable thing that might serve if you're into that kind of thing as a point of entry into the PlayStation ecosystem, yeah. you know, same as Microsoft are doing with theirs. But like you said, they're not really innovating this space and they're going to be in competition with, you know, so many other services. Yeah. Um, yeah, again, you just struggle to see it gaining a lot of mainstream traction, to be honest. Yeah. I think that, yeah, I, I agree with that. I think that the fact this is launching in Japan, right, is, is kind of telling. I mean, you know, Sony's a massive, massive brand, particularly massive in Japan. They're going to have a good foothold there with lots of things that they launch, I think. So, I don't know, I'll probably be surprised to see it launch over here anytime soon. Yeah. Yeah, uh, and uh, I guess that is uh, pretty much all in terms of stories for this week. Uh, I, I was trying to dig up uh, whether any uh, speakers had been actually announced at IFA last week uh, as part of the Spotify Connect thing, but I couldn't actually find any story that detailed exactly what models had been announced for Spotify Connect. So uh, I think we're just going to have to wait on that one. Uh, I was expecting like a large amount of speakers to be announced, but I just wanted to, to look at that. I couldn't find anything on that. Uh, and uh, um, in terms of, uh, I wanted to look at the calendar quickly so uh, this week it's culture tech in Derry so it's an interesting conference combining technology and culture uh, with uh, lots of speakers and music is a big component uh, next week it's a future music forum in Barcelona so futuremusicforum.com uh, then the week after on the 24th it's a music 4.5 smart radio event uh, talking about everything to do with internet radio and digital radio uh, all, all about that and uh, I think we'll talk about o October at a later point because there are so many events happening it's uh, kind of become conference time again so uh, yeah it's, it's, it's all going to be crazy. And uh, well, thanks so much for uh, coming on. It was great having you. Uh, again, it's uh, Lucy Blair uh, on uh, Anjuna Beats. It's anjunabeats.com, right? Yes, that's right. Great. And uh, Eamon, you can find his work on uh, Music Ally and uh, for a bunch of other publications. Do you have a, your own site, Eamon, that I can plug? No, I don't. I'm very oh. bad, but I, I haven't bothered. I'm just really lazy. <laughs> Absolutely. And I'll, I'll put your... So that, that, that's a good advertisement for the work that I do. I'm too lazy to build my own website. <laughs> no, it's because it, you, you, you do too many things at once, so you just don't have time to do it. I do. I, well, I just live on Twitter and Facebook. So uh, Exactly. I'll, I'll put the Twitter, Twitter handle on, on, on the show notes, of course. And uh, uh, then we have Jesse uh, at wixedworks.com, right? Perfect, that's right. Perfect. And uh, of course, I'll put the Twitter handles for everyone uh, on the show notes. And thanks so much for joining me today. And really glad, Lucy, you managed to stick around for the whole show. Uh, and, <laughs> and thanks so much for listening today. If you enjoy the show, I would love you to pass it on to one more person today. Uh, you know, with, uh, and you can also email with your feedback, of course, on contact at digitalmusictrends.com. Or it'd be lovely if you left a review on iTunes on one of the four feeds we have because it's an audio show and also a video show. And we have two shows per week. Uh, uh, you can also check out the DMT one-to-one -one, where I do individual interviews. I think this week I'm going to have uh, 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 Brian Zisk from SF Music Tech and we're going to talk about uh, that and how they set that up. Uh, thanks so much for listening. Have a great week and until next time. And that's all for this week. I really hope you enjoyed the show. Check out digitalmusictrends.com and sign up to the weekly newsletter.